guess I'll be brief. Okay. okay, Lindy, why don't you start off, uh, if, they, if you're comfortable doing that, talking about how uh, the Bogs and the Johnsons came together and became friends, first got to know each other. Okay. In 1941, uh, Hale Boggs, my wonderful husband, uh, was elected to the Congress and went to serve, and he was the youngest member of the House at the time. He was 26 years old, and uh, I was 24, and we had a perfectly wonderful experience uh, being in Washington. This was 1941. And the, the atmosphere was both friendly and, and exciting, and then becoming more and more apprehensive uh, about World War II and all of the involvement that was, was uh, brewing uh, in, in the areas of, of legislation and, of course, the military involvement and so on. And it was a, a glorious experience uh, for our two young people, vitally interested uh, in, in politics. But we also were lonesome for our friends uh, our age uh, that we could socialize with, not just on a political basis, but on a friendly and social basis as well. And of course, among those, that when we found were Lyndon and Lady Bird Johnson. And that was 1941, and we've been friends all these years. And over the years, my admiration for both of them and each of them simply became greater and greater and greater. And my love for them endured in those proportions as well. So it's very nice to reminisce uh, about them and about our years together, and about the friendship that we've shared, the places we've been, the legislation we've been involved in, the great moments in history have been there, and especially to talk about what Lady Bird Johnson has been able to do for this country. So if we'll start out uh, in 1941, uh, we have to remember that the country was very, very anti-war. As a matter of fact, a week before Pearl Harbor, Speaker Rabin had to take the vote three times on the floor to get the extension of the military draft passed by one vote. And th that was the attitude of the country. Well, shortly after that, this group of um, Japanese uh, appeasers came over to visit and uh, for some reason or other I was very suspicious of them. Hale teased me a lot about that because he said you always believe in everybody why would you be suspicious of these Japanese? And I said I don't know I just have this peculiar feeling. Well the following Sunday um, <clears throat> We had bundled our two children, Barbara and Tom, up one in a, in, in a stroller and the other one in a buggy. The weather had been terrible in Washington. And finally, I was going to be able to get out of the house with these two little creatures, and Hale was there to help me with it. And as we were going out of the door, the telephone rang. Paul Wooten, who was Mr. Journalism in Washington, and the correspondent of the New Orleans Times-Picayune, uh, who lived in our building, called and said, turn on the radio, the Japanese have just bombed Pearl Harbor. And uh, my first reaction was, oh, that, that, that just couldn't be, he, he, it couldn't be Pearl Harbor, it must mean the Philippines. And uh, so, then I looked at Hale and said, with these babies bundled up, and said, you know, the radio in the car gets much better reception than the radio in the apartment. So let's get in the car and we'll go down and see what's happening. And we did this. And we went, of course, past the 
British Embassy where there was a lot of activity, a past French Embassy where there was so much activity, then past the Japanese Embassy where they were actually burning their papers in the front lawn. Then we went on down and got as close to the White House as we could, <clears throat> and then finally to the Capitol building. And it was, uh, it was a very traumatic experience because um, I used to pick up Hale at the Capitol building when we were first there, and I loved looking at the Capitol dome always. And especially if you went down in the late evening and the lights came on on the dome, it was just so beautiful. About the third night I was doing this, a voice next to me said, isn't it the most beautiful sight in the world? And I turned around and it was Speaker Sam Rayburn. And he said, whenever I'm really tired and really frustrated, I come out here and look at the Capitol Dome, and it renews my hope and renews my courage, renews my strength, and I go back in and battle with those guys. And just as we were standing there, looking at the Capitol Dome, the lights went off uh, because of fear of air raids. But the next day, President Roosevelt ordered them back on all the lights in Washington, and of course, that was the spirit that was there with Lyndon and Lady Bird, with Hale and me, and with all the, the members of the Congress and the related activities and organizations. So we've been friends all these years, and we've been through this war, this, this terrible war, World War II, we went through, of course, all of the ramifications of it, and, and, and Pacific and Europe, and everything that went on about it. Hale was uh, went on to join the Navy. Uh, the, the young members of Congress wanted immediately to go to war, and Mr. Sam told them that that was very foolish; that their their districts would go unrepresented if uh, they were. Uh, had gone off to war. And so it wasn't until after the term was over, uh, of course those who, who were in the military reserve had to go, but uh, it was, and then the war finally was over, of course, and we all came back to the Congress. And our friendship, the johnson Boggs friendship, just endured and grew and in all sorts of proportions, in all sorts of dimensions. And uh, the, our friendship, Lady Bird and I, are still s such good friends today. And of course, she was the mainstay of uh, so many of the programs of the Johnson era. And you have to look back and recognize that we had all of the problems of integration in the South. And so that the, the way to campaign for, when, when Lyndon was campaigning for the vice presidency, was to take a, a train through the South. And a, a, a group of good friends of, of the Johnsons, uh, with Liz Coffinger, of course, helping in every way, uh, went through uh, the South uh, ahead of the train. Uh, to uh, be able to create pockets of, of support to call on the wives of the governors and the mayors and uh, the legisl state legislatures of wherever the train was going to stop and uh, to try to, to work up um, uh, some enthusiasm and some, some organized support in each of those places. Well, the, that worked out very, very well. And so four years later, when the president um, was running for the, again for the presidency after having, of course, become president with the assassination of President Kennedy, uh, we had another train through the South, and uh, 
the, the way to do that was to have it a ladybird special because she could get into any of those places in the South. And what a remarkable trip that was and what a mar remarkable contribution uh, she made uh, to the country and, and to her husband and, and to the party, uh, the Democratic Party. She was absolutely amazing. Then, of course, we get into the, the full Johnson administration. And we had the, the great so-called beautification program that Lady Bird established and, and ran. Uh, she, she may uh, pretend to be letting other people run things, which is the way she gets them enthusiastic, but Bird runs things herself as well. And the beautification program, I was always sorry that it was, it was called that because it sounded much more frivolous than it actually was. It was a remarkable program across the board uh, to not only clean up cities, not only clean up neighborhoods, not only have remarkable kinds of, of uh, loans and so on in, in order to, to improve neighborhoods, but it had building codes it had, uh, uh, you not only took the, the, uh, the big signs off of the highways, but you beautified the highways in very special ways. And the plantings, of course, were always uh, so well selected. They stopped erosion, they, the roadways needed less watering, less cleanup, uh, they were safer, and uh, it was unfortunate that some of the the people in, in the, the Congress thought of it only as a, quote, beautification program. But Brad was very, very astute about getting the, the bill passed. Uh, for instance, I was going to a state um, to talk to the Democratic women of that state. And I got a call from Bird saying, I understand you're going to such and such a state. And, well, would you please call the senators and tell them that you're going to their state and uh, that you would really like to be able to announce to the Democratic women that they have signed on to the uh, highway bill? <laughs> so, and, and, of course, I, I followed her instructions, but that was the, the kind of personal diplomacy, shall we call it, uh, that she engaged in in order to get the program through. And all of us know the great benefits that have, have accrued from, from that program. I, there's so many other things that she did. Her, her involvement with the Head Start program um, and after their retirement, uh, Lyndon still went to the Head Start programs, uh, I think in Fredericksburg and all around the LBJ Ranch. And um, he, he brought lollipops to the children and they called him Uncle Lollipop. And this, their, their interest in the program remained with them and with Lyndon all the days of his life. Uh, Hale and, and Lyndon had a, a wonderful uh, political kind of a partnership as well as a friendship. And it was, uh, Lyndon sometime leaned on Hale and heavens knows Hale leaned on, on the president. But, uh, uh, Lyndon assigned him to both uh, the, the Kennedy assassination, the Warren Commission, and then later to the Eisenhower Commission on Crime. 
and that kind of trust and friendship that existed between them. Was Our connection, right. I guess, uh, least, uh, that's about where you finished. And uh, did, did, did I talk about Ladybird after that or before that? Before the, the, before that, uh, on the uh, beautification and so uh -huh. forth. I think so, didn't you? Yeah, I, she did on about beautification. Before the uh, Warren Commission. And, uh, oh, after. Yeah, 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 you did. You, I, I think you finished before. with the beautification. Uh-huh. Okay, and then ready again. Uh -huh. Okay. Going back to the uh, to the nineteen well, you were involved in the nineteen sixty uh -huh. Democratic uh, Kennedy Johnson uh, inaugural program. You were chairman then. The um, I I had a, a very had a very very interesting experience with the uh, Kennedy inaugural. Uh, I was the I had chair of the inaugural commission and um, the the very very difficult problems that we had um, grew out of the fact that so many people wanted to come to the inauguration and so many people wanted to go to the inaugural ball that it was impossible to be able to accommodate them all. The previous uh, commission for the Eisenhower <coughs> inaugurals had, had strongly advocated that there be just one great big inaugural ball because it didn't matter how many others you added, you were never going to take care of all the requests anyway. So we planned on this, to have the inaugural ball at the D.C. Armory. And we built a, a great tent, but very well floored, heated tent uh, adjacent to the armory uh, in order to uh, have some uh, space in, in the in the tent where people could go and have have uh, cocktails and and have incidental uh, fun music uh, in in the tent and then come back into the ballroom for all of the grandeur and the pompous uh, attitudes. <clears throat> but the uh, we we had a, a very very strong push by the various hotels and other venues in town and finally had to give in to the fact that we were going to have to have multiple balls. I think we ended up with either five or six balls, I've forgotten exactly. And the, the, the difficulties were compounded by the fact that there was a horrible snowstorm and people had to mush through the snow to pick up their tickets and so on. And I actually missed the inaugural ceremony because I was at inaugural ball headquarters trying to appease some of the, the angry people who were there trying to get their tickets. I finally said to them, you know, I think we really came to witness the inauguration. Could we just be quiet long enough to see President Kennedy and Vice President Johnson sworn in, and there was a lull in the uh, angry agitation. <laughs> but th that was a, a very, very trying experience. Uh, as, as it turned out, everything came along quite well, and uh, the, the night was of the inauguration was finished in great glory at the inaugural balls. Uh, but. It was a very trying experience for the people in charge. Well, four years later, I had a call from uh, President Johnson. He was in New York for some reason, 
and he called me and asked me if I would be chairman of his inaugural balls. And my first reaction was, you gotta be kidding. <laughs> but I, of course, he wasn't kidding, and I, uh, of course, followed his, his uh, direction, and we were able to know that you had to have multiple balls and to prepare for them uh, way in advance, and I think it all went quite smoothly, and we had a very good inauguration. The cooperation uh, with the Johnson administration, of course, was, was so wonderful. And Liz Carpenter was a, a, a great go-between, between, between the East Wing of the White House and the West Wing of the White House, having worked for the Vice President, Lyndon Johnson, and then gone over to be uh, the head of Mrs. Johnson's, of Lady Bird's operation, uh, put her in a position of cooperation, appeasement sometimes, and so on, that was made for very fine organizational activity. And so many good things came out of that. Not just beautification, not just Head Start, but many of the solid areas around appeasing the people so, so incensed by the Vietnam War um, really emanated from her kind of participation. I'll never forget um, being at, at Linda's wedding at the White House. Uh, George Hamilton had been a beau of Linda's and they'd been down here to New Orleans at one point, and we'd had such a good time, and I enjoyed George very, very much. I must say that I'm crazy about Chuck Robb. <laughs> the, uh, and uh, at, at Linda and Chuck's wedding, we were standing, uh, George Hamilton and I were standing together, and uh, in the middle of the wedding ceremony, to hear the, the terrible protesters interrupting the wedding ceremony with that horrible yell they had, of, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids have you killed today? And it's a memory that I will never erase because it proves to me how great both Lyndon and Lady Bird were at rising above that kind of criticism and being able to go forward with everything that was good and noble and fine for this country. Uh, it's so nice that our friendship endured following uh, the Great Society, following the end of the war, following all of the, the things that, that happened that were so good for the country. And, uh, uh, and we had a, a, a lovely, lovely time. When Hale's plane disappeared, uh, Hale was campaigning with and for young Nick Bagich of Alaska. And uh, the, they were, their plane, of course, was lost in, in Alaska, and we were never able, to spy, despite a remarkable search by, uh, by the government, uh, to find other plane. Uh, friends and family kept urging upon me a, a memorial service. And um, I was very reluctant to have a memorial service because I thought if Hale and Nick were still out there or hanging on someplace, that it sent the wrong vibes to them. But when the Congress met uh, in January, uh, they declared the seat vacant. And, and, and the, the, Uh, the memorial service. You could start it, uh, the seat being declared vacant. 
uh, Hale's seat was uh, the, the seat in the second congressional district of Louisiana was declared vacant. And um, the, the, there was um, a memorial service, a beautiful memorial service. And I, I, had, I of course, wanted Lady Bird and the President to, and Lyndon to be there, but I knew he wasn't feeling well, and I didn't want to impose it upon him. And I was so um, very upset about what I should do about it, but at any rate, uh, I called him, and, and he came. And after all of the beauty of of the service, we stood at the back of Old St. Louis Cathedral here, holding both hands, looking so hard into each other's eyes. And I suppose I loved him more at that moment than all the other times when I loved him so much. But then, of course, I sort of found myself running for Congress. I don't remember making a, a conscious decision. <laughs> and uh, um, it, it, was, um, it, it was a very uh, interesting sort of a situation of where, of course, he was being very supportive of me. And then I went up to my home uh, parish, county, uh, of Point Coupe and to Old St. Mary's Church where I'd been baptized, received my communion, been uh, confirmed, been married, and uh, to, to be able to give proper thanks, I felt, in that, that setting. And um, it was Hale's birthday. And when I came back to New Orleans, uh, everybody that I, I saw said, Mrs. Johnson has been trying to get hold of you. And when I called her, it was to tell me that Lyndon had died. And uh, it, it just sort of brought everything together. And it was, uh, my, my daughter Barbara, uh, who is deceased now, called me and said, Mom, you know, it's just like those two. I, why would he die on this particular day that meant so much to you? <laughs> and, and I said, I don't know, maybe he wanted me to remember it. But the, our lives sort of came full cycle. And uh, I made my peace with the fact that, in all probability, I'd lost both Lyndon and Hale. So I then, of course, ran for Congress and, and um, was elected, served for nine terms, and I had all of the benefit of the years of experience and the, the friends and the supporters and the helpers, not only within the community of the Congress, but with the outside community, with the party affiliations, and so on. So the influence of, of Lyndon Johnson on the Boggs politics was very profound. And in later years, uh, I've been privileged to go with, with Lady Bird to various places uh, for our holidays, and uh, it's always been the happiest times of my year. Uh, the last place we were able to go abroad was to Wales, because Lady Red wanted to see the beautiful flowers in Wales once more before her, her eye difficulties became more intense. And we hadn't been in Wales um, but a few hours when Linda arrived. 
and said, oh, I just love Wales. I just had to come back to Wales. <laughs> so we realized that that was the last time we were going to be able to go abroad together. <laughs> and the, um, the way of going abroad, of getting away, of being surrounded by beauty, and being able to be with friends, was to go to Martha's Vineyard. And those, those days I will always live in my memory with the greatest fun, sweetness, affection, liveliness, intellectual stimulation uh, of any other experiences in my life. Uh, Lady Bird is a tower of strength to this country. She was the, the real guiding light, the moral compass, and the legislative and, and professional helper uh, to the president, to the vice president, to the senator, to the congressman, uh, all those years. And uh, I think that this nation owes her a tremendous debt of gratitude for all that she is and all that she's done for us. Do you um, have any particular memories of uh, his sense of humor? <laughs> uh, one, one of the ongoing uh, sort of problems, I guess you would say, <clears throat> that occurred in the Boggs Johnson relationship. Uh, was surrounded by the fact that that Lyndon loved a certain kind of a chicken recipe that Emma Cyprian, who was our maid, uh, knew how to make and served often. <clears throat> and um, uh, he kept trying to get the recipe from, from Emma. And finally, Lady Bird put Zephyr, uh, the Johnson's cook, on the phone when he was vice president. And uh, I was listened in to this conversation, which was the most amusing conversation I think I've ever heard. <clears throat> and uh, Emma was telling Zephyr some things about the kind of chicken you had to get. and how, what you had to do with it, and how you had to prepare it, and the other things you had to put in the pot, and so forth and so on. And when it was all over, and the conversation had been concluded, and I hung up and I said, Emma, you didn't give Zephyr the right recipe. <laughs> and she said, if he wants my chicken, he has to come to my kitchen to get it. <laughs> it, was, it was really funny when they got to the White House. I then said, Emma, you really have to give that, that the correct recipe to Zephyr because there's going to be times in the White House when he's going to get provoked with the White House food and want some home cooking. And uh, she said, no way. He's got to come to my kitchen to get my chicken. <laughs> so I think she was the only person I ever knew who really withstood the pressure of Lyndon Johnson. <laughs> you, uh, you have similar memories. black employees trying to drive through the South, I, uh, that, as President Johnson did. Uh, you know, we, we certainly did, and uh, it was it was a it was very very hard. Uh, we drove back and forth, mostly because we had to transport 
children and so on and, and goods. And it was so expensive to try to go on the train. And um, you only got two trips a year uh, with the expenses paid for them. So uh, we would pile all the children and pets and, and, uh, and so on into the car. And, and then we had, uh, because travel was just so impossible for them otherwise, we would take, we had Emma Cyprian and they had Sapphire Wright with them. And uh, you had to have either friends or, or designated uh, motels and hotels along the route uh, that would take uh, a, unfortunately in those days, it would take a black person in. And um, they, there were some of the old good family hotels that would do that. And sometimes you would drive for miles uh, to get to the places of where you were certain you would have a, a, a pleasant reception. And these were, were experiences that we shared that, that were so, so very hard. Emma, for instance, Cyprian, um, had been uh, a teacher and uh, in, in, the, in her early days, you could go to what is really a, sort of a junior college uh, and get a teaching certificate after two years because, of course, there were very limited opportunities for, for blacks to go to colleges and universities. And uh, she was a teacher and uh, was very, uh, very, very good at her job, expanded the school year's program from five months to six months and finally to nine months. Um, her husband uh, drove a bus to get the children to school and to take them home. And uh, along came uh, equal pay for equal education when all the young people were able to go to four-year colleges and to get the regular teaching certificates of the state. And instead of being dis destroyed because she was going to lose her position, she was very encouraging uh, to the young people to finish their four-year experience and to, to get them into a teaching job. Well, that was that was very lucky for us because when she gave up her job to a young qualified four-year college uh, prepared teacher, uh, she came to us to live with us. But it was always such a, a, a sadness to have these lovely ladies uh, refuse admittance uh, to places that uh, where we we felt that they they were much more able to enjoy and and to be a part of than the people who were already in there. <laughs> but uh, at one point um, after the Johnsons were were uh, retired, uh, Hale and I went by uh, uh, to spend a couple of nights with them at the ranch. And uh, the first morning that we were there, uh, there was a, the door open to the bedroom and it was Lyndon and he said, Shh, come on out here. So I threw on a robe and I went out and uh, he said, I, I got something I want you to, I want you to read. So we went downstairs and sat by a window in the dining room at the ranch, looking out over that beautiful country. And he wanted me to read the script uh, for his book about the experiences of going back and forth 
with Zephyr and Emma, but his experience is about going back and forth with Zephyr, and my comparative uh, experiences with going with Emma. And uh, it, it was such a, a sweet exchange uh, to have this total understanding of these two Southerners, these two friends, these two people so devoted to equal rights, civil rights. Uh, and I was so honored that he wanted me to do that. The, uh, I think the Something is blinking. Yeah. I stop blinking. Okay. 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 Good. okay. okay. Speaking of civil rights and uh, Emma and, and Zephyr, I'll never forget the the Ladybird special uh, train ride and the big and remarkable kinds of, of uh, meetings that we had all along the route. Uh, when we'd done the, the vice presidential train through the South, we learned a great many things. And we understood that when we'd go into a, a, a town where the train was going to stop uh, and engaged a lot of help with the people, that what we really needed to do uh, the second time around was to leave a person there with them to continue the organization and to be a, a sort of a go-between between the the committee for the train and the local committees. And this was one of the things that we were able to do. Uh, of course, also on the Ladybird special, we had many male politicians of, of, uh, of great stature who were going along and at the Varda, we would always pick up uh, the governor, uh, uh, the mayor of the city that we were going into, and so on, uh, to ride and to speak from the platform uh, as in, in the town. And uh, sometimes there would be a big meeting, and we would leave the train and go to a town setting, a city setting. Uh, and there was a group of, of hecklers who had started following the train around. It had the itinerary of the train, and at each stop, uh, the hecklers would be there. Finally, we got into uh, a stop in South Carolina, and uh, the hecklers were in great force. They had infiltrated into almost every area of the crowd. It was an enormous crowd. And at a, a certain signal, all began to chant and to, to say awful things and so on. And Lady Bird was uh, speaking. And all of the men got very, very upset about this. And they all tried to you know, calm the crowd down, to fuss at the crowd, to do all these things. And finally, Lady Bird said, I'm sorry, I was the speaker, <laughs> and I am going to speak. And so she, she goes on to the microphone, and she says to the crowd, uh, all right, you've had your say, you've had your protest, you've made your points, but now I am going to speak. I am the designated speaker for this meeting, and I am going to speak, and I expect you to listen. And of course, the crowd calmed down, and she gave her speech to, of course, the thunderous applause of the people who were there other than the, uh, the hecklers. And it was such a, a great example of her determined dignity and her effectiveness.
we, I, I remember one of the one of the uh, the trips, advanced trips, and, and ahead of the ahead of the plane, and and uh, uh, I should have asked you this before I started. Was it Lorraine Gibbons? Was that her name? Oh. Lorraine Gibbons from Texas, beautiful redhead. Um, Wayne Gibbons, my wife. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't tell the story, but it was such a cute story. We we had such terrible weather on the plane trips. At a time of year when you had all those little storms, and it was a small plane, and we'd go up and down. And one day it was really scary. And Lorraine gets on the intercom and says to the pilot. Now you just straighten this plane out. Don't you know I'm back here making my face up <laughs> for for the next stop? And you just you just stop bouncing us all around like this. <laughs> it relieved everybody's fright, of course, <laughs> in the doing. <laughs> I was going back to um, to Hale's memorial service. Uh, What really makes uh, the president's uh, coming here more poignant was that his doctor told him not to. Of course he did, and I told him not to. And uh, it was, and I just knew standing there looking into his eyes. And then we had to go outside. Um, president Nixon didn't come, but Pat did. And the egg news came, <laughs> and uh, um, but we went outside to, and there was this uh, this gun salute, and when the first one went off, it just sort of reverberated through my body, and I thought, how can I stand here for twenty more of these without crying? And just about that time, all the pigeons flew off of Jackson's statue and everything, and my little five-year-old grandson pulls on me and says, Mama, how come they're shooting all the pigeons? <laughs> and it relieved, relieved the whole situation <laughs> remarkably. <laughs> and we stood there, but, but you know, Lyndon stood there through all of that as well. And he was not well, and it, it, was, it was sad, so sad. But uh, it was so like him. He was such a loyal friend. That's beautiful. And your tribute to Lady Bird was just was fantastic. Unless you have something else. It was just wonderful. Do you really do we cover everything?